Hello, everybody. What does this vote cast by Barack Obama, the former president of the United States, have in common with the late president of Venezuela, Hugo Chavez, and a second-rate magician like El Gran Vladimir? In the minutes that follow, we'll explore these and other questions as we try to uncover the details of a vast conspiracy. What he means is, is that the conspiracy starts at a single source, but can then spread. That's right, because the supervisors oversee the county budget. I mean, they oversee everything the county buys, which includes voting equipment. Rigged voting machines here could make the difference in a statewide election. In 1998, a lieutenant colonel with a pension for coups d'etat, Hugo Chavez, is democratically elected president of Venezuela. However, his behavior didn't always fit the democratic model. On Tuesday, February 4th, 1992, Venezuela wakes up shaken by an attempted coup led by lieutenant colonel Hugo Chavez to overthrow the then constitutionally elected president of Venezuela, Carlos Andres Perez. Failing to capture Caracas, the capital of Venezuela, the insurgents surrender. The constitutional government's armed forces recover the garrisons in the interior of the country, and Hugo Chavez is arrested. But first, he's allowed to address the country before the media. Compañeros, lamentablemente, por ahora, los objetivos que nos planteamos no fueron logrados en la ciudad capital. Es decir, nosotros acá en Caracas no logramos controlar el poder. All the participants in the military revolt go to prison, but later the case is dismissed, and the coup plotters are released years later during the presidency of Rafael Caldera without a criminal record. So here we return to where it started, the presidential elections of 1998. Hugo Chavez, the former coup leader, is the victor and becomes the constitutionally elected president of Venezuela. Juro delante de Dios, juro delante de la patria, Juro delante de mi pueblo que sobre esta moribunda constitución haré cumplir, impulsaré las transformaciones democráticas necesarias para que la República Nueva tenga una carta magna adecuada a los nuevos tiempos. Lo juro. With Hugo Chavez in power, Cuban dictator Fidel Castro will finally fulfill his longing to expand, finance, and perpetuate his revolution of taking hold of Venezuela. Si alguien ha cometido el error eres tú, no considerado un enemigo pequeño. From the very day of Hugo Chavez's presidential inauguration, he began to dismantle Venezuelan's democratic institutions until they became mere facades. In 1999, the newly elected president, Hugo Chavez, promotes a fundamental process to draft a new constitution and sideline the National Assembly, ending with a single blow nearly all the constitutional powers of the country, the legislative power, the moral power, and the judicial power. No daré descanso a mi brazo, ni reposo a mi alma, Entregaré mis días, mis noches y mi vida entera en la construcción del socialismo venezolano, en la construcción de un nuevo sistema político, de un nuevo sistema social, de un nuevo sistema económico. Juro por Cristo, el más grande socialista de la historia, a una costa de mi propia vida a una costa de mi propia tranquilidad. Patria, socialismo o muerte, lo juro. After several purges over the years, Chavismo end up successfully hijacking the National Electoral Council, the Supreme Court of Justice, ministries, the armed forces, the oil industry, and the media. La palabra lo dice todo, poder. In the two presidential elections that Chavez won in 1998 and 2000, the voting population had been six and a half million. So the voting population was six and a half million, and the opposition would collect almost three and a half million signatures in favor of launching the recall process. And it was also to be expected that there would be more yes votes than the number of signatures collected. Therefore, it was easy to conclude that with the remaining voters, President Chavez could never succeed in the referendum. Even without the yes votes, his regime wouldn't surpass the number of signatures. And now, Houston, we've got a problem. Una alianza estratégica con Cuba. Reinforcement came from Havana. Just before the referendum, a subordinate of the head of Cuba's intelligence services, Ramiro Valdez, 
and Jose Lavandero, vice dean of the University of Information Sciences of Cuba, began to advise Venezuela's National Identification Office. And so mission identity started. What could have been the solution? Subtract votes from the yes column and add them to the no column. And of course, raise the ceiling of the total number of votes to add those new votes to the no column. Do you believe that when citizens don't vote, their votes are stolen? Is this even a possibility? Is it feasible to use the gaps in the list of voters to turn them into votes? What's more, it is also possible to artificially create these gaps and then fill them with more votes? The California Elections Code requires an audit of 5% of touchscreen voting machines. And here it is. A preliminary audit indicated discrepancies, but the final report said the race was clean. The auditor changed his mind. Maybe we should talk to him, find out why. But of all the changes to the electoral system, the most controversial, even among the leaders of the opposition itself, was the electronic voting system, the Smartmatic machine. <laughs> Despite brutal government repression to prevent citizens from asserting their constitutional rights, the Venezuelan opposition finally calls for a referendum to revoke the presidential mandate. In the months leading up to the recall referendum, and according to most polls, there was a sudden change of tide. Chavez's popularity and that of his government had swung in his favor. The polling company North American Opinion Research, followed by Venezuelan pollsters such as Data Analysis, started to spread the word about the shift. A survey by the US firm North American Research in June, granted 57% in favor of Chavez. Chavez is rising and the opposition is weakening, says Luis Vicente Leon of the polling company Data Analysis. But who is this US company so knowledgeable about opinion trends in Venezuela? Here's the answer. North American Opinion Research was registered in Miami, Florida on March the 2nd of 2004. It's interesting to note that it shared the same address as Petro Tulsa, a cooperative linked to the Chavista government providing services to the Venezuelan state-owned company, PDVSA. Naturally, this reversal was very discouraging to the country's opposition, which has spin its democratic aspirations on that referendum. However, not all pollsters were on the same page. A survey of professors from Venezuela's Central University College of Statistics predicted a sizable win for the opposition. When a national newspaper reported the results of the survey, that edition was taken out of circulation due to government pressure. What is Smartmatic? Who is Smartmatic? You really can't miss it. The yellow button at the back of the Sequoia voting machine. Tens of thousands of machines used in 16 states and Washington, D.C. That button puts the machine in manual mode, so anyone can vote and repeatedly cast as many votes as they want. All sorts of electronic glitches are showing up. Screens display the wrong candidate when a button is pushed. Today in Cuyahoga County, Ohio, large print options didn't work properly, cutting off candidate names. And election officials struggled with other electronic snafus. We just got notice from the uh, Secretary of State's office today that some of our voting units will not be reflective of daylight savings time. Potentially causing the machines to close down early. Technicians from the voting companies are working to sort out the last-minute problems. Today, activists pointed out that Sequoia will again have Venezuelan nationalists as support workers on the electronic machines. That's in Cook County, Illinois. Now, the workers are project managers from Smartmatic, the Venezuelan company that bought Sequoia. Election officials say they have no way of knowing how many Venezuelans will be there on Election Day, but they've seen some around. In the year 2000, a young Venezuelan engineer named Antonio Mujica registers Smartmatic's hardware and automation software with the United States Patents and Trademarks Office. That same year, from the same location in Boca Raton, Mujica also registers a company called Vista Corporation as an internet business service and software developer. Prácticamente en control total de un, un centro de votación aquí en pequeñito dentro del Hilton 
para poder probar, jugar con las máquinas, transmitir, totalizar e incluso al final auditar todos los resultados junto con este, la data de totalización con una conexión al servidor del Consejo Nacional Electoral. What nobody knew until the Miami newspaper El Nuevo Herald published its findings was that the Venezuelan government had invested $200,000 in Vista Corporation, effectively buying 28% of the company that would produce the software for the voting machines. The Venezuelan opposition, however, never spoke out, not so in other parts of the world where Smartmatic was being challenged. So we're just wondering why, uh, in the case of Smartmatic, you did not have this kind of a precaution to make sure that uh, the times are uh, synchronized with each other, because it would be anomalous, very obvious, Mr. Chairman. I understand, sir, with all the respect, it's, a it's an unforeseen situation. It's one Unforeseen that even if fraud is committed, we would be able to trace it. We never said that fraud could not be committed, but you said we could trace it, and now you tell me that at 10 in the evening you could do it and we would never know. No, sir, I stand by our product and we can Son trace everything bitch. that we do. I move that the unparliamentary remark like SOBs be taken off from the register. Yes, they should be taken off. <laughs> My God! There was also no objection to the new voting system by the Carter Center, which was supposed to be the guarantor of transparency for the already murky Venezuelan elections. Just seven months after Hugo Chavez's victory in the recall referendum, Smartmatic purchases Sequoia voting system one of the largest voting automation companies in the world. The United States Congresswoman, Carolyn Maloney, alarmed by this purchase, sends a letter to the Secretary of the Treasury in which she says, if Smartmatic only had a one room office with only one secretary, how could a company of that size buy a bigger and better established voting company like Sequoia? If so, how? the technological advancement, the great number of security mechanisms and controls uh, to make it secure, and, and the high level of confidence at the levels of the political and social leadership, I would say, in the countries. Um, there are still some doubts among some of the population um, between 25, between a quarter and a third, I think, in, in the polling indicates that they have uh, some doubts or some lack of confidence in one aspect or another of the electoral system. The same thing could happen with the accountability of a voting system. What guarantees credibility is an outside party that verifies that everything is in working order, that it's real, that it's true, like in the $100 bill trick. Before the recall referendum, an audit was carried out, but it happened in the offices of Smartmatic, and it was the Electoral Council itself that unilaterally appointed the folks in charge of auditing the system, therefore violating the fundamental rule of any audit. The entity under review cannot review itself, nor was it possible to carry out a comprehensive audit of the software and hardware of the voting machines. These improprieties are pointed out in the report by the Carter Center which, in spite of that, gave the green light to the system. So under these adverse conditions in 2004, Venezuelans take part in the recall referendum. Of course, Hugo Chavez wins, and his victory is endorsed by the Carter Center. The referendum takes place in a typical fashion. The electoral votes by pressing the touch screens on the brand new election machinery. The voting machine spits out a paper ballot to be placed in a ballot box. The voting ends. The devices are connected via internet, and once the connection is complete, the machines print out the results in minutes. The ballot boxes are never open. The ballots are never counted. Everything happens within the voting machines. It is an act of faith. Has met or surpassed every security requirement. Our machines create a paper trail that can be audited. They're actually more secure and easier to use than any paper ballot system. After the voting takes place, results were audited in only the 20 municipalities out of over 300 throughout Venezuela that the Electoral Council has chosen. And of the almost 200 audits that were scheduled to be carried out, the Carter Center only carried out six, and of those six, in only one were the votes counted. 
Why only audit 20 municipalities? Did these 20 municipalities utilize the same system as in all 300? The answer is no. There's a crucial difference. In the selected municipalities also utilize a fingerprint sensor. If all the ballot boxes had been opened, what would have happened? Three days later, in the subsequent audit, they surely opened some of the ballot boxes which had been safeguarded by military personnel who embodied the revolutionary new man. Everything was falling into place perfectly. El Centro Carter puede dar alguna garantía que del de domingo hasta el día de ayer, cuando llegaron los observadores a las correcciones, no se hizo ningún, algún cambio? Claro que no. Esto, las, todo la, el material eh, de la votación ha sido la responsabilidad del CUFAN, del Plan República, como siempre en Venezuela ha sido. Y entonces lo que te, tengo entendido es que ellos han, han tenido la responsabilidad de mantener la seguridad de todos los materiales antes, ayer, hasta ahora. Había dos grupos, un grupo de la OEA y el grupo Carter. Grupo Carter que conversaba a escondidas con el gobierno, que se encerraba en reuniones con los rectores del oficialismo y que tenía actitudes tales como están denunciadas en la carta, como que pidiendo el sector opositor que se haga una auditoría, ellos dicen que cómo no, que la auditoría se va a hacer, pero que esa auditoría la va, la va a diseñar el CNE, ¿y quién es el CNE? Los tres rectores mayoritarios del régimen, conjuntamente con el Centro Carter. The elections in Venezuela, although some people have criticized the result, which is Hugo Chavez having won, there's no doubt in our mind, having monitored very closely the election process, that he won fairly and squarely. As a matter of fact, of the 92 elections that we've monitored, I would say that the election process in Venezuela is the best in the world. Excluyéndolo del diseño y de la observación de la muestra a los dos rectores opositores y a la OEA que se va indignada. Is this suspicion enough to deduce that some form of manipulation took place? Could it be inferred that there was fraud and verified with a numerical method? Let's, let us take a look at it. Here we go. You know what, that's a very good observation, Oswald. Because there are too many sevens. And threes. Too many for what? Too many for this list to be random. Yeah, for, for some reason, when people make up reports with numbers in them, they always put in way too many threes and sevens, and not enough ones and twos. Me, I think I'd use too many fours. I mean, this way, you can not know what the numbers describe, but you can tell if someone is lying. Those vote totals should be random, and they aren't. When the numbers are truly random and represent measurable quantities like the length of a river, the numbers of inhabitants of a city, or the numbers of followers of Twitter accounts, the frequency of the first digit looks like this, and that of the second digit looks like that, as on the graph. When the numbers are simulated by a computer, they look like a graph. The difference is, in summary, that actual numbers trend towards the so-called Benford distribution, and computer simulated numbers tend towards uniform distribution. But it wasn't until 1994 that an accounting professor named Mark Negrini proposed using the analysis of the frequencies of the first and second digits to detect possible fraud and irregularities. If the frequency of the first digit is the key to determining an irregularity, the second digit takes the findings to the next level. Using Benford's law, Mark Negrini uncovered such a fraud, the Enron case, one of the biggest business scandals in history. The collapse of the Enron Corporation put thousands of employees out of work and cost investors billions in losses. Enron has become the leading symbol of corporate scandal. Today, a jury in Houston convicted former Enron executives Kenneth Lay and Jeffrey Skilling on multiple counts of fraud, conspiracy, and related offenses. The judge also convicted Lay of bank fraud 
and false statements in a separate case tried to the bench. Lay, Skilling, and their numerous co-conspirators perpetrated an elaborate scheme to mislead analysts and investors about Enron's true financial picture. The second digit numbers of the Enron's balance sheets published by the Wall Street Journal violated Burnford's law. The publication of this finding in an article instigated the opening of an investigation that resulted in the fall, due to fraud, of two large companies, Enron and its auditing company, Arthur Anderson. Over time, Benfors Law became the numerical test par excellence for fraud detection. Nowadays, anyone scheming a fraud takes Benfors Law into account. But of course, in 2004, at the time of the Venezuelan referendum, Benfors Law was unknown and unthinkable because it is counterintuitive. Therefore, it was impossible that anyone could have foreseen it. In first place, a register electoral correct part of the base that the Venezuelans have the right constitutional rights to choose their leader. But when they increase a register electoral, they are generating individuals, even inexistent. In fact, the first estimations that they made revealed that more than 4 million people actuaban de manera inexistente. Entonces, eso ya es un primer elemento que induce a pensar que se crean individuos artificialmente, se les dota de cédula de identidad a extranjeros que no, que no si ni siquiera se han nacionalizado y se construye entonces una, una, eh, una base electoral que favorece a, la, a, la, a los planteamientos del a few weeks after the referendum, the Carter Center receives two allegations of fraud in reports showing that the number of no votes reported by the voting machines was anomalous because they didn't reflect Benford's law. The theoretical physicist Imre Mikus and the mathematicians Luis Raúl Perici and David Torres sent two separate studies to the Carter Center in which the results of the Venezuelan referendum of 2004 do show overwhelming anomalies. Both studies, similar to each other, were based on Benford's law. They no longer relied on the analysis of the first digit, but instead on the second, since the cap of voters per machine affected the behavior of the first digit. In the Perici Torres study, for example, it was estimated that the probability that the no votes emitted by the voting machines in accordance with Benford's law, which is fulfilled by the votes of all elections was practically non-existent. As unlikely as flipping 120 coins and all 120 coins showing heads. Something even more revealing appeared on the further second digits analysis. The pattern was just the same as those generated by computers. Houston, we've got another problem. So what does the Carter Center do with these studies based on Benford's law? They forward them to two experts from their staff, Dr. Henry Brady, who only observes the first digits of the current election and rejects these allegations of fraud, even though the work of Perici and Torres explains that to corroborate fraud, you should observe the behavior of the second digit and not the first. And they also forwarded the studies to Dr. Jonathan Taylor, who, observing how the second digits of the votes of two virtual elections that he generates in his computer violate Benford's law, concludes that the actual number of votes doesn't necessarily have to comply with Benford's law. And for that reason, it also disqualifies the allegations. Forensics, it's a hopefully growing new field that combines political science with statistics, a little bit of law, a lot of computer science, and is really, really important. But Dr. Walter Mebain, the most definite authority on electoral fraud, observed that none of the two mathematical models used by Taylor to generate results on his computer had the complexity necessary to produce the results that fulfilled Benford's law. It was unthinkable that for such an endeavor, an academic of Taylor's stature would use simulated numbers instead of real numbers. The Carter Center concluded, it is the opinion of the Carter Center that the August 15th vote expressed the will of the Venezuelan electorate the center did not observe the credible evidence of fraud that would have changed the outcome of the election. And thus, the cries of fraud were silenced for a time.
nunca antes en toda la historia política venezolana tuvo nuestro país un árbitro electoral del tamaño, de la transparencia y de la calidad y del compromiso que hoy tiene el poder electoral venezolano. Perhaps the key to understanding all the Venezuelan electoral processes is contained in a simple list. Simple, yes, but devastating. A list that has brought about exiles, suicides, financial ruin, firings and death. It was known as the Tascón list and had come about from the petition for a recall referendum on President Chávez in 2003. El que firme contra Chávez. Ahí quedará su nombre registrado para la historia, porque va a tener que poner su nombre, su apellido y su firma, y su número de cédula y su huella digital. The list owes its name to a deceased pro-government legislator named Luis Tascón, who got hold from the Electoral Council of first names, last names and identity cards numbers of all the citizens who signed the petition for the 2003 presidential recall referendum. But Tascón not only created the notorious list, he also posted it on a website so that the country's leadership could find online who had signed and who had not. Those citizens who signed the petition in 2003 were penalized for their intention to eject Hugo Chávez from the presidency. The government was responsible for their dismissal, expropriation, imprisonment and exile. The apparent intention of those who signed the petition was to activate the presidential recall referendum and vote yes to remove Chávez from the presidency. In the more affluent areas of the country, the percentage of people who signed the recall petition was very high, not so in less affluent municipalities or rural areas. It was not to be expected that in such widely different socio-economical areas, there would be a direct correlation between the number of yes votes and the signatures on the petition. However, there was 1.16 yes votes per signature. Even in those rural areas, without collection centers, four signatures. In the voting centers, in the more economically affluent neighborhoods, the signatures turned into yes votes. The rest of the votes, from people who had not expressed their political opinion, and had not signed the petition for whatever reason, were reasonably distributed between yes and no votes. But in digital polling stations in rural areas, or in economically deprived urban areas, this was not the case. The signatures on the petition turned into yes votes, but nearly all the rest of the voters cast no votes. This was a direct result of the fact that in these areas, the ratio of signatures to votes tended to have the same value as in the previous instances, 1.16, 1.16 yes votes per signature. Gustavo Delfino and Guillermo Salas, upon noticing this trend, pose the following hypothesis. In computerized centers, official results were forced to follow a linear relationship with respect to the numbers of signatures. This would be a way to subtract more than one million yes votes and add them to the no votes. The response Delfino and Salas received from the editors of Statistical Science, the journal to which they submitted their article, states, Your paper has been carefully reviewed by an editor and some expert referees. As you know, our plan is to publish this paper as part of a special section of analysis of the Venezuelan referendums. Please download the three reports on your paper, which you should use to guide your revision. The third report by Rodrigo Medina, a very impressive verification of your hypothesis. Verification of the hypothesis of Delfino and Salas by Rodrigo Medina, doctor in physics. It is verified in agreement with the hypothesis presented by Delfino and Salas that the official results of the recall referendum of 2004 in each automated center were invented based on the number of signatures. The magnitude of the difference between the official results and the real results was estimated at 1,370,000 votes with an error of 20%. According to this hypothesis, the suspension of the audits of the results that occurred during the recall was selective 
and not by chance, as the Carter Center maintain. To be able to carry out a selective suspension of the audit, a control system that can interact with the machines is required. But did it exist? Many Venezuelans, such as Professor Luis Marin, a law professor at the Central University of Venezuela, felt a huge mistrust of the outsized use of technology. In his article, El Tonto de la Colina, an evident allusion to an opposition group that defends and supports the use of all this electoral technology, he states, they want us to believe that all of this equipment, the Smartmatic, the fingerprint capture technology, the data transmission system, is there to defend your vote and my vote. For those who defend the Delfino and Salas hypothesis, the presence of the fingerprint capture technology in the voting centers existed for a very different reason than the regime's version. The fingerprint capture was just an excuse to place laptops permanently connected to satellite dishes a few meters away from the voting machines. This was an authentic Trojan horse to introduce a control system in the audited polling centers and monitor the voting in real time. As such, the government can include the data of millions of people, real or not, whose existence and identity are impossible to verify in the voting records. Needless to say, as of that moment, the source file that fed into the electoral registry began to expand in a shameless and extreme rate. An 11-year-old boy just hacked into an imitation state voting website in less than 10 minutes, and he wasn't the only one. DEF CON is one of the world's largest hacker conferences where hackers and cybersecurity experts attempt to break into computer security systems. One of the conference's main purposes is to show how easy it is to manipulate software and hardware, and this year about 50 children ages 8 to 16 attended. One of the features at the event was the DEF CON Voting Machine Hacking Village, which included 13 websites that imitated voting sites from presidential battleground states. That's according to PBS. The 11-year-old boy was able to hack into an imitation of Florida's site in less than 10 minutes. On August the 4th, 2007, there was a new wrinkle that set Venezuela's electoral process into further disarray. That day, Venezuelan businessman Guido Antonini Wilson arrived at Buenos Aires International Airport. To his misfortune, the airport police and a customs agent discover him carrying a briefcase with nearly 800,000 undeclared dollars. Antonini receives asylum in Miami in exchange for collaborating with the FBI and insists that the money was from the Venezuelan government for the electoral campaign of the future president of Argentina, Cristina Kirchner. A few months later, in December of that same year, the FBI detains three Venezuelan citizens and one Uruguayan citizen at Miami International Airport, accusing them of being Venezuelan agents appointed to pressure Antonini Wilson and to prevent him from revealing the origin and destination of the $800,000 briefcase. A man named Moises Mayonica was one of those four foreign agents in the USA, and at the same time, according to information provided to the Argentine newspaper La Nación, was responsible for delivering the fingerprint capture technology to the Venezuelan government through a company named Cogent Systems. The fingerprint capture machines were the only missing piece in completing the puzzle of a colossal lie the unidirectionality of the voting machines. Each fingerprint capture device connected to a laptop in any election presents the possibility of connecting to a satellite dish and interacting with all voting machines in real time, in short, a Trojan horse. So was there fraud or not? Was there a conspiracy? When Claire Cameron Patterson warned that tetraethyl lead in gasoline was poisoning humanity, or when John Judkin described the significant damage caused by excessive consumption of sugar, forces conspired to silence them. In both cases, articles were published in scientific journals that contradicted their findings and sought to discredit them. Patterson and Judkin were trampling on significant economic interests. After the 2004 referendum in Venezuela, 
a number of scientific articles corroborated the massive electronic fraud that had taken place. Of course, articles that contradict and even discredit their authors have not been lacking. But the reality is that throughout the world, many refer to the Venezuelan elections as fraudulent. And it does not happen only in Venezuela. It happens in other parts of the world as well. In the 2012 presidential election, Barack Obama, like many other US citizens, cast his vote on a machine utilizing Smartmatic technology. A German court, in a single sentence, solves the dilemma of the voting machines. A citizen has the right to understand how he exercises his right to vote. An election cannot be an act of faith. Dangerous connections, mere fiction, other conspiracies, or is every conspiracy theory a figment of the imagination? <laughs>